All right. Yeah, so I'll, I guess I'll just stay here and open the eight prime stage with our keynote speaker, and uh, he will be starting, Dave, very soon. So once more, thank you for being here. It was a rough morning. When I woke up, it wasn't a morning at all. It was like <laughs> a Silent Hill scene. And, uh, but being here with all of you again for fifth year in a row really uh, 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 gives the purpose to all of us here in the HIP space team, in HIPCON organizing team uh, as well. Uh, Dave, if you would be so kind to step up, the stage uh, is yours for the next hour. Of course, uh, 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 all sessions will be interactive towards the end if the speaker allows for that. <laughs> so if you have any questions, just feel free to shout out, ask them. We will have microphones running around and uh, 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 just don't be shy. All right. So we have Dave Snowden here, just setting him up. Ah, right there. Okay, I think this is the first time I've followed interpretive dance in my entire speaking career, so I'm doomed to disappoint, I think. All right? um, what I want to do is to introduce some of the new thinking we're doing around design thinking, uh, just to get sort of fairly controversial and direct up front. Uh, design thinking in its popular form has become a commodity in the same way as Agile has become a commodity over the last two to three years. And when things become a commodity, they start to lose value. Yet they become standardized, they become anodyne, and so on. So what I want to do is to introduce some of the core ideas underpinning this rethinking of design, talk about some of the implications of that for things like IT architecture, and basically give you some of the reasoning behind what we're doing. So that's the plan. Yeah? Um, this is a cartoon from Gaping Void. We use them a lot in cultural mapping. Uh, we've actually just produced a whole cartoon set of these around the state of Agile at the moment, which is available as a survey type instrument. But it's kind of like making a point about the difference between complexity thinking, which is where I come from, and systems thinking, which has dominated the last three or four decades. In that what we actually saw come in in the 1980s is an attempt to replace human judgment with process. If anybody's seen HR departments, everything became a matter of spreadsheets rather than actual human engagement. And one of the things the Agile movement was about was trying to restore a degree of humanity within the system. So that cartoon is intended as a flag on that. Yeah? Um, it's not just about algorithms, it's not just about process, it's about engaging people in radically different ways and using the creativity of people. Uh, one thing, if you don't know it, and this is you know, scientific fact number one, is that art, i.e. music and painting, come before language in human evolution. That's actually really significant, because human language evolves from abstractions, not from naming physical phenomena. And the evolutionary argument as to why that has continued yeah, is that by moving up a level to a level of abstraction, by seeing things in a radically different way, which is what art allows us to do, we have huge resilience as a species because it allows us to invent novelty. Which means an excessive focus on STEM education is actually quite dangerous for society. Um, I've just finished an, arg an article for the ITEL community related field, which says nobody should be allowed to be a systems engineer in a modern company unless they've had a basic training in ethics and aesthetics. Because the ethical implications of what everybody does in IT these days are huge, and they need to be understood at the level of the people writing the code, not just the people commissioning it. There's a level of responsibility here that we need to deal with. So what I'm going to do is to run through a series of these science, science facts, which I intend to, to, to place most of my reliance on, and I'll explain the significance later. So the first is that concept of art and abstraction. Uh, the ability to disconnect yourself from the material, from the concrete, to see things from a different perspective. And that's the essence of innovation yeah, within, within human systems. Um, the second is a so-called cognitive bias. Now, this is a misnomer. Um, evolution doesn't produce things which don't have, don't have utility. Human beings have, and I think there are identified about 150 so-called biases. Uh, nature is not that inefficient. Uh, biases are actually a form of heuristic, a way to reduce the energy cost of making decisions. 
Now, and don't misunderstand this. We have biases because actually they make us more efficient. And we evolved to make decisions collectively, not individually. We evolved as a clan-type species, not a set of isolated individuals. Individually, we're very poor decision makers. As a clan, we're a very good decision-making species because we have what's called cognitive diversity in the clan, behavioral and experiential diversity, and that can overcome so-called individual bias. But this is one of the most significant if you give radiologists, and radiologists have you know, several generations of developing their body of knowledge, they have an average 15 to 20 years training, and they're dealing with a limited information data set which they actually understand, you know, an x-ray. So if you give a batch of radiologists a group of x-rays, ask them to look for anomalies, and on the final x-ray you put a picture of a gorilla which is 48 times the size of an average cancer nodule, 83% on average of radiologists don't see it, even though their eyes physically scan it. And the scary thing is the 17% who do see it come to believe they were wrong when they talk with the 83%. Now just start to think through the implications of this because it invalidates any systems analyst who says they can understand what users need. Yeah, because you will not see things that you do not expect to see. In evolutionary terms, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, if you think about the early hominoids on the savannas of Africa, yeah, um, and something large and yellow with very sharp teeth runs towards you at high speed. Do you autistically want to scan all available data, look up a catalog of the flora and fauna of the African veld, and having identified lion, look up best practice case studies on how to avoid lions. Yeah, by the time you've done that, yeah, the only book of any use to you will be the book of um, will be from the Old Testament, the book of Jonah, which is the only example I've found of how to escape from the digestive tract of a large carnivore written by a purported survivor. Uh, we evolved to make decisions very quickly based on a partial data scan, privilege on our most recent individual and collective experiences. You see my point about energy reduction? You can't afford to look at everything, so you look at the things which are likely to have the most significance. Now this is something we have to design around rather than try and prevent. If this is the way human beings make decisions, and it is the way they make decisions, we have to find the 17% before they talk to the 83%. And we have to make that visible. And I'll talk about how we actually do that later because that's a key aspect of modern forms of ideation and also problem discovery. The second thing being is complexity. And I'm not going to go into the Kinevian framework now. There's lots of stuff on that in Agile. But the essence of a complex adaptive system is that everything is connected with everything else. Yeah? And a lot of the connections can't be known. And they're called constraints in technical language. And one of the terms I invented, which has been picked up a lot, is the concept of dark constraints. That's a reference to dark energy or dark matter in cosmology. We can see the impact of a constraint, but we can't see what's causing it. Now, the reality of any system involving human beings, it has multiple interconnectivity that we cannot fully understand or ever discover. You can't reduce a human system to an engineering diagram or a systems flow diagram that is only ever a partial representation of one aspect. And that means we've got to find novel or new ways of, for example, making culture visible. Culture is a fundamental aspect of any system, but it can't be designed in the way you design a machine. It has to evolve in the way you manage an ecosystem. So the essence of complexity, and the point I want to really push here, is a complex adaptive system has no linear causality. This is the most scary thing for anybody from a Western education to have to understand. You can't say, if I do A, it will produce B. You can say, if I do A, it might produce B, but it could produce Z in an unexpected way. The only thing I know with absolute certainty about a complex adaptive system is that whatever I do, there will be unintended consequences. Which means the bigger my intervention, the bigger the unintended consequences, 
and the less likely I am to admit failure until I have no alternative. So complexity is all about very small things in near real time, experimenting in parallel, not in sequence, which is why, by the way, Scrum is not a complex technique. It's a complex to ordered technique. That's its strength. It's doing many small experiments in parallel to discover what's possible. Now, I'm going to talk about some techniques later because one of the really important things to manage in a human system are the informal networks in the organization, not the formal system. When I did my first work on complexity, when I was working for IBM, I identified that the ratio between formal and informal communities was 1 to 64. And that was only those who were using technology to communicate, so it was probably much bigger. And the reality of the whole edifice of IBM was held together by informal networks, not by formal systems. So informal networks are a vast, untapped resource for system design, and we need to bring that into play, and I'll talk about ways to do that later as well. So complexity, it's important to understand it's non-causal, and a simple heuristic is this one. If the evidence supports conflicting hypotheses, and the contradiction between those hypotheses cannot be resolved within the time frame for your decision, then the problem is complex. And if the problem is complex, you can't find a solution by analysis. You have to find a solution by parallel experimentation and see what happens. And that's kind of like a fundamental phase shift. It's, it's a design switch. So that's um, inattentional blindness, and that's also complexity. The third one I want to talk about, which I'm going to use a lot, it comes from evolutionary biology. And this is a neologism, a new word called acceptation. So we all know about evolution. I'm in Europe now, not the US. I'm not allowed to talk about evolutionary theory with the Ebola management teams in the States because it's considered a controversial idea. I get really worried about that sort of thinking, right? Um, but basically, in evolution, we know that things adapt over time. That's the classic neo-Darwinian approach. It's not Darwinian, it's neo-Darwinian. It's an important distinction. So the idea is traits evolve for a specific function. Um, it's held originally to be survived with the fittest. We now know actually it's survived with the luckiest, but that's a little bit more controversial. Um, so a trait evolves. So if we take dinosaurs as a good example on this, we now know that all dinosaurs had feathers. Discoveries in northern China are giving us huge new insights about dinosaurs. So if you have kids with books about dinosaurs, you've now got one up on them because you know something which isn't in those books. Right? So all those dinosaurs had feathers, and feathers were actually very colorful. So the current argument, and the only reason we can see for feathers, was sexual display. That's what they evolved for. Yeah? And then one dinosaur started to develop skin flaps under its forelimb, to better display the feathers. And those were the dinosaurs which, when they fell off cliffs, glided and survived. So flight was exaptive, not adaptive. That's the difference. So a, a trait which evolved for one function, sexual display, in a linear way, under conditions of stress, exapts for something completely novel or different. And that couldn't happen in a linear way, because if dinosaurs threw themselves off cliffs in the hope that they would develop wings before they hit the ground, then they wouldn't survive to breed. The other example which I use a lot is the hippocampus at the base of your brain, which evolved in higher apes yeah, to manipulate, do fine grain manipulation of muscles in fingers so that you could pick seeds from seed pots and make better tools. It accepts in humans to manage grammar in language. The huge sophistication of language in human systems couldn't evolve in a linear way. It's too big a step. It required a non-linear, exaptive repurposing. The scary thing for your health, by the way, is that virtually nothing which human beings now relied on evolved for the purpose which it now provides. It evolved for something else, and then it accepted. Now, I think this isn't relevant te to technology, then the link between these three things should be well known to you. In 1945, a Raytheon engineer maintaining the magneto of a radar machine noticed that a chocolate bar melted in his pocket. Lots of people had noticed it, and they just swore and got their trousers cleaned. 
he realized the significance, we got microwave ovens. That's an example of acceptation, repurposing something which already exists for something novel. The classic case in IT is that IBM got first mover advantage in the early development of computers because it was the worldwide expert in punch card machines to control sewing, automatic sewing machines. So it repurposed that to create computer programming devices. And by the way, I'm one of that generation that started to program on punch cards. Uh, when I was at school, the headmaster told us that if we learned how to use a punch card machine, we'd have a job for life. Uh, teaching kids Java code is the modern equivalent of that. Right? Uh, by the time they have to do anything, it will have radically changed anyway. You're better teaching them design and ethics. Right? Um, and actually, I will actually argue that all programmers should still use punch cards for at least a year, because if you get a compile error on card two, it teaches you a degree of discipline in writing code. Right? Uh, but the point is, that's an example of acceptation. Most human innovation, make, most technology innovation, is radical repurposing of an existing capability rather than complete novelty. And once we understand that, we can design systems to manage what are called exaptive moments. That's something else I'm going to build to. And of course, reality is never the way we design it. This is your first cute cat picture for the day. These are the latest addition to the Snowden household. Um, there's a general rule, by the way, that if you have cats, you understand complexity. If you have dogs, you're trying to avoid it. Yeah, the British phrase is, dogs have masters, cats have servants, all right? That's, that's the way it works. Either way, my wife has actually designed the home around these cats, including some very elegant and expensive designer beds. But they never sleep in the beds, they occupy my laptop bag. If you actually check out the speaker room, you'll find I'm not carrying with this, because I have to sneak out very early in the morning to get possession of it. Because if I don't, the cats have occupied it, and I'm not allowed to take it. Yeah? Reality catches up. Yeah, human beings are more like cats. They don't do what we design them to do. They do what seems convenient and comfortable at the time. Right? And therefore, designing spaces where these things can happen is more important, and then allowing for emergence is more important than doing everything from scratch. So that's the core science. What I now want to do is to talk a little bit about how you understand when things can change. That will also say what I'm arguing at the moment, we need a radical reinvention of Agile if it's to survive in any recognizable format. And also we need to do the same thing for design thinking. Right? And I'm going to talk about that to some extent in the history of computing. So one of the things that you get taught in management school is that fundamentally there's a thing called a market life cycle curve. You've probably seen them. They look like that. There are various forms of this. But what you've got here are what are called early adopters, which is 2.5% of the total market. These are from original data from Procter & Gamble work, but they're sort of fairly solid in most disciplines since. Now, early adopters are a nightmare to sell to. I'm currently in my third software startup. The first two were in big companies. The latter one is for myself. Um, early adopters are the people you do not want to sell to. The minute you show them your software, they don't want to look at what it does for them, they want to look at how you built it. And once they've looked at how you built it, they'll tell you how you shouldn't have done it that way, and they would have done it differently. Now this, by the way, is an IT developer disease. Yeah? And when I set up one of the first object libraries in Britain in the 1980s, I banned developers from having access to source code because it was the only way of stopping them constantly changing it. Right? They, they'd miss the actual point. Um, early adopters are the people who you buy them a brand new car and instead of using it to drive you to somewhere beautiful, they take the car apart yeah, because they want to spend the whole weekend maintaining the thing and changing the oil. You get the sort of point here? Yeah? These people waste a huge of time because they're not interested in what it does, they're interested in how it does it. But that's where most products start. After that, you get what are called the early majority. These are about 13.5% of the total market. And whereas these buy, people buy how it does it, these people buy what it will do for me. They're not particularly interested in how you do it. They don't want multiple case studies because they want first mover advantage. 
but neither do they want to be your experimental subject. Now the key thing to understand is when you enter this phase, whoever controls this phase controls everything which comes after. So this is the key phase to actually get dominant market share. If you're the biggest player at this point, then as the market choo tunes into two different stages, but I'll put them all together as one, which is a majority, yeah, these guys buy whatever these guys prefer. IBM became the dominant provider of hardware, and once it had got that place, it was almost impossible for anybody to shift it. Microsoft then took over and became the dominant supplier of software. It was almost impossible for people to shift it. And notice in both cases, the worst technical solution won. Yeah, because it actually got to market faster and it controlled that space. Yeah? So I belong to that generation that why on earth have we got IBM System 36s when we could have VAX clusters which actually work, all right? But that's a different generation. Okay. And then we finally get this group who are, very, who are called laggards. I call them sad bastards. Who only buy things at the tail end of a market. This is generally government, by the way, or some large industry. They only buy things when everybody else has realized they don't really work anymore. Right? That's, that's a familiar pattern. Yeah. Now, a guy called Jeffrey Moore, who wrote a brilliant book called Crossing the Chasm, which is still relevant today. It's several decades old. It doesn't look actually look like this, it looks like this. This is a peak, and then you fall into a chasm. And the problem is people project growth like this, and it doesn't happen. Because there's a gap between the guys who will always buy something new and the guys who want to exploit it, because they wait to see if it works. Yeah, and that's why a lot of things fail. Now, there are a couple of consequences for this. One is that actually, if you can start and sell here instead of there, you actually can actually introduce new products in radically different ways. Now, I was teaching this stuff in Berlin yesterday, but I'll just give you one example. Um, back in the 1980s, I was working for a company called Data Sciences. I was part of the management buyout team. And we were actually European experts in RADJAD. Anybody remember RADJAD? It came before Agile. Rapid Application Development, Joint Application Design, um, and object oriented Code. We did a lot of defense work. We had super slick programmers. Trouble is, nobody wanted to buy it. Everybody was buying legacy system management. Remember, this is before the year 2000? Yeah, I could see that coming, so I removed COBOL and Fortran from my CV in 1989 because I didn't want anybody to know I could code in that language because regardless of status, you'd be put onto the teams. Yeah. So what we did, and this is a symbiotic strategy, and I'm going to use symbiosis as a strong metaphor here, is we went to a company in France called Unilog, who were the world, you know, European market leaders in legacy system management, but had no UK presence. So we became their UK distributor, which meant we had Les Methodes Francais, which always goes down well in the UK. It has sort of sexual overtones to it, and so that actually helped the marketing. We had all of their cases, all of their references, but then we differentiated our, differentiated our offering with object wrapping of legacy code and JAD sessions to design priorities. So we put the things that we were really good at as a small, low risk, risk element onto something that people already wanted to buy, which meant we built our case studies and within two years, object orientation and RAD JAD was 60% of our business. So we brought novelty in on the other side of the chasm. The other thing we did is myself, uh, my equivalent in Logica, who are our main competitors, and a guy called Ed from Cambridge Scientific, who was also a competitor, sat down in a pub in Cheltenham one day and created a DSDM consortium, which was a consortium of competitors to produce an international standard for Radjad. We were British, so we did it in one night in a pub in Cheltenham. The Americans did it in Snowbird in a ski resort over a whole week. That's the difference in culture, right? Um, but the key thing we did is to say any international standard or any new method has to be developed by competitors, not proprietary. Because if you develop methods in a proprietary way, you end up accelerating the decline of the field. And that's what we've seen with Agile, 
with the Scrum Kanban wars, with SAFE, with LESS. Everybody's tried to create a proprietary method. Nobody's really invested in developing the field. And that produces short-term gain at long-term cost. And again, I'll come back to that in a minute. Now, what I did was to combine this with S-curves. So what you actually get is a pattern which looks like this. The novel idea comes in. It's very novel. It drops into the chasm. It, but then, sorry. The novel idea comes in, it drops into the chasm, it then becomes the dominant idea, then it loses utility. So I've taken the classic S-curve you've seen in lots of literature, but I've added the chasm to it at the start. Now the other thing I did is to say the reason you get the chasm is that the previous dominant idea is coming to an end. So the old way of doing things is kind of like maxed out on utility, so there's space for something novel, but the fact that it's what everybody does makes it difficult to adopt. So you've got a paradox between the need for radical change and the dominance of the old idea. And this actually gives us two key moments, and this actually, by the way, applies to internal organizational change as well as to whole markets. This here is called the exaptive moment. It's the point at which you need to find something you're good at and repurpose it very quickly in order to dominate the next phase. And that, of course, means you've got to do that sort of parallel experimentation I've talked about. You've got a very limited time window to do it in before you get to this point, which is called competence-induced failure. That's a reference to Clayton Christensen's famous work we said companies fail, not because they're incompetent, but because they're too competent at the old paradigm, so they don't see the new thing coming. It's also called the Kodak moment. Remember, Kodak invented digital photography, but couldn't make the shift because they were making too much money out of film, as a result of which they lost everything. It's very, very difficult for what's called an apex predator, the dominant person, to make this move. Now, the final illustration is I mentioned IBM. Remember IBM repurposed punch cards? 1980s, you couldn't actually sell against IBM. Nobody got fired for buying IBM. In the modern day, nobody gets fired for hiring McKinsey's. It's the same principle. You're not doing the best thing, but you're doing something which minimizes your risk. One of the problems Agile has got at the moment is the big six consultancies have moved in. So it's now a commodity procurement. So if I'm a procurement officer in a large company, I need to buy a whole bunch of Scrum coach training. Am I going to go to one of the big six? If it goes wrong, I won't be blamed because I went to the big six. Or that nice bunch of good agile people I used to use, but nobody knows about them. So if it goes wrong, I'll get blamed. And that's the big switch we're starting to see happening now. Good people are losing business to bad people because they don't have the name, because the market has shifted out of that ad early adopter phase into something which is a late adopter phase, at which point people buy, buy the market leader. The other thing which happens is the market leader doesn't see commoditization coming. So IBM didn't see that hardware was becoming a commodity. Because they're the apex predator, they can command the margin even when other people are having to slash it. So when they discover it's a commodity, it's too late for them to change. At which point, everything moved to Microsoft and software. And remember, Microsoft repurposed code that IBM had paid them to develop, which they'd stolen from somebody else in the first place, and that became Windows. Yeah? And after that, everybody bought Windows, even though it was total crap. It was still kind of like working off punch cards, if you want my opinion. It hasn't changed much since. Right? So I'm, I'm an Apple fanboy. Right? Um, and then Microsoft don't realize that software is becoming a commodity, in fact, it's becoming free. And actually, they almost go under, and they get displaced by Apple. And Apple realized something, a key phrase from anthropology, objects of material desire. Apple realized that people wanted something beautiful, which did something they didn't know they needed until they had it, then they were desperate to keep it. Right? And actually, if you delivered hardware and software together, you could do that very effectively and very quickly, and the only people who want hardware and software to be separate are geeks 
who make all their money out of solving the problems that users can't cope with. Apple solved that with the Apple Store and everything else. And now they're the world's largest company. You see what happens? And also, the other thing Apple did is they repurposed Next. Everybody forgets that. Next was one of the best development languages around at the time. It went bankrupt. They repurposed it to create OS. That gave them, again, that first mover advantage. So this is a key thing to understand. And the point I'm trying to make here, and I'm going to go on to what we do about this now, is that Agile has moved into that commodification phase. The first indication of this is when SAFE came along. I think the first time I saw SAFE was at a conference in Serbia. So I'm very sorry, Serbia has very bad associations for me in Agile. And I wrote a blog post in anger called The Infantilization of Management, which was written in five minutes in anger and keeps getting picked up. Right? Because to me, SAFE was the exact opposite of what Agile was meant to be about. Now, I'm going to be quite brutal about this. It played to three things. It allowed executives in large IT departments to say they were being agile, but not really change. Yeah, it sold off a basically scheme in which if you did the four-day course, yeah, you were then authorized to do the three-day course, provided you paid a royalty. You didn't have to have any experience whatsoever. Right? That's called a pyramid selling scheme. But it played to the weakness of the agile community who wanted coaching revenue. And also, it cost you several million to implement with no good results expected for at least two years. Executives love that because then they can announce the program and move on before the consequences of their decisions become visible. Now, this is a corporate survival trick. Yeah? And then, of course, instead of competing it directly, the Scrum movement tried to ally with less. Now, the project management guys have gone with Dad. Everybody's trying to compete with the dominant predator rather than do something differently. And that's a sign that something has become commodified and you need to move on and rethink. Yeah, anybody wants to argue about this, have a beer, that's fine. I'm on a flight at 5 o'clock, but I'll do any argument on this that anybody wants. All right? um, the good news is it means we can actually go back to the heart of Agile, to use one of Alistair's phrases. Yeah? But it's a chance to rethink. Yeah? Design thinking has gone down the same route. If you actually look at it, in fact, they're using the same accreditation process. From being something done by gifted people in highly facilitated environments, it's now become an online course, and for God's sake, it's got certificates. The minute people give you certificates for attending a two-day course and filling out a multi-choice questionnaire over eight weeks on an open book basis, then the field has lost all intellectual and practice integrity. I see people with letters string after their name I've got three sets of letters I can put after my name, but they all come from three years of study and proper examination, not from paying to turn up a course or answer some questions. Sorry about this, guys. It actually represents an unprofessionalization of a field which desperately needs to be professional. Right? And that's the thing we need to address, and the same is happening in design thinking. So let me move on and look at how we do some of this stuff. So I want to go through four separate things. If you look at design thinking, it talks about a linear process, and you see the same thing in terms of agile software development. Yeah? Scrum is a linear process, albeit in a short life cycle. Yeah, the value of Scrum is a short life cycle with iteration. Yeah, but it's still a linear type process. You have a user executive, you go through a process. Yeah? Um, what they do is they do ethnography. Well, actually, they don't do ethnography. If you know anything about anthropology, ethnographers spend years getting deeply embedded into communities. What they actually do is they do a few interviews and a few observations, and they call it ethnography because it sounds cool. Yeah, but they call it ethnography. So what we're switching is from an individual expert doing ethnography to distributed ethnography over large populations in which communities interpret their own experience. So we move from a linear to a distributed approach. In terms of ideation, what you actually get is you sit through the workshop, you come up with the needs, you study the material, then the experts go away and come up with brilliant ideas which you'll love when they spread out into the next day. We switch from that expert-led ideation into distributed ideation of a cognitively diverse populations. So I'll talk about those two because they're key. That allows us to, way by to go into near real-time creation of new novel products. 
And then we need exaptive connections. We need to manage for people to see how they can repurpose something they're already good at because that's the fastest way to novelty. And finally, probably the most important concept that I'm going to put across today in terms of IT is the idea of scaffolding. Uh, one of the issues on the complex adaptive system is I don't know what the endpoint can be. Because of the multiple interactions in the present, I have to allow a system to evolve. Now that means I've got to put temporary structures into place, not permanent structures. Now this is actually a big issue in modern IT architecture. So what we've been developing over the last year, working with people in Stanford, MIT, uh, Ross Foundation and so on, is to actually create a typology of scaffolding, different metaphors for scaffolding, and the principle of design now is you first of all decide the level of uncertainty, you then decide the type of scaffolding, you put the scaffold in place, you define the interactions of software and people within that, then you allow systems to emerge from that interaction. You can't design the endpoint, but you help design the pathway that the journey can take. So I'm going to go through that as well. Which means I'm going to go on to practice, and this is your second cute cat picture of the day. Uh, that was the first time uh, Lyra went outside and the first time she saw a bird. Um, the birds now arrive in our bedroom every night as gifts, all right, in various stages of death or living. Yeah. Um, this cat is a hunter. Um, she actually now sits on the balcony of our bedroom and, and catches bats in midair by leaping from the balcony, catching them and landing on the lawn. Right? Um, so I want to focus on how we actually make a difference, and a cat hunting is a good focus example. So let's start off with a nice two-by-two, two because it will make it easier. So remember I talked about ideation and ethnography. I'm going to call it discovery now. So if your discovery is expert-led, that means a systems analyst goes out and interviews people. That's the classic IT approach. You identify a user executive. You make the user executive responsible for the requirements, the building of the backlog, etc., etc. That's expert-led. Distributed means you involve large numbers of people in near real time in capturing their day-to-day -day anecdotal experience of what works and doesn't work. And a key concept in complexity, disintermediation, you don't allow that to be interpreted by an analyst. You give coders direct access to the raw anecdotal data. Epic story points are contraindicated in complexity because they involve too much synthesis. Yeah? They have value in other contexts. On the other dimension, we look at how we create ideas. So it can be the expert, the people who really know what they're doing, or it can be distributed ideation, a large, cognitively diverse process. Now, I'm not arguing here that any of these things are necessarily right or wrong, but they're different, and we can't make any of them universal. So within this, this one here is a Deo. That's the thing you get taught. If anybody consultant comes to you and teaches you design thinking, they're taking that variation. So that's the expert, or you do the analysis, you do the gathering of material, you then do the ideation, you involve users in workshops and interviews, but it's expert-led in terms of problem identification and also development. That, I would say, is also the bulk of Agile. Yeah, you define the requirements, you create the backlog, your coders are allowed to actually self-organize, they're the experts, yeah, and they produce code. Nothing wrong with that, it's hugely valuable. It doesn't handle high levels of uncertainty, then. The next thing is where I distribute discovery, but I actually use experts. And this is called effectively managing to unarticulated needs. This is a really important aspect of the next generation of agility. Yeah? Because actually, technology is advancing faster than users know what to ask for. Yeah, technology can do things that users have no awareness of what it can do, so relying on a user-generated backlog is very limiting. So what we do here is over the course of three months, six months, or continuously, we continuously capture users' frustrations, ideas, or experiences into what's called a narrative database. And when we get clusters or statistical significance in that, we present the raw anecdotal data to a bunch of coders who know what the technology can do, and they produce a prototype and ask the users if that would be useful. You see that change? 
and not waiting for somebody to procure IT and looking at genuine needs on a distributed real-time basis and I'm using my expertise to suggest things and this is about IT and Agile becoming strategic not a manufacturing unit. At the moment IT is seen as a manufacturing unit which produces code it's not seen as strategic in terms of generating novel ways of working. So that's actually something which we can move to quite easily. That's a logical next step. The next thing is where we have a problem. We know what the problem is, but we don't, want the, don't know what the solution is. Yeah? And this is what we call mass sense making. This is where I present the problem to thousands of people and ask them to come up with ideas. We're actually launching a public one on this tomorrow. Uh, last week we launched a narrative database, some of you have seen it, contributions really welcome, yeah? on small things that people can do to do something about climate change. Now, I wrote a blog on this, the problem at the moment, climate change is such a big problem, everybody's trying to avoid talking about it because it seems impossible. That's a human reaction. So we created a narrative database for people to share ideas of small things that people could do which would make a difference. And we've just, tomorrow, we're taking three of those and anybody who wants can come up with ideas about what we could do about it. So we're effectively taking a defined problem but then we're distributing it to a large population of people with high cognitive diversity and seeing what ideas they generate then we'll look at clusters in those ideas and we'll try and find the 17%. The people who are actually thinking differently about the problem. Now again, that's something you can do easily in ID. IT, that's called distributed intelligence, is a type of wisdom of crowns. And then we get to the really exciting one where you distribute both. And that's called managed acceptation. Now managed acceptation is where you distribute the requirements and you distribute the cognition and you allow the various components to come together and when needs cluster with ideas you look at the combination and say can we do something with this? So that's kind of like managing the events which gave rise to the microwave and which gave rise to other things. We did this with a major lighting company in Europe some years ago so we captured self-interpreted stories from large numbers of people about their gardens. We then captured all of the technology companies' expertise and skills at a, the right level of granularity. This is a key phrase. Both of them were self-interpreted at the point of creation by the originators into a high abstraction metadata set. I haven't got time to go into that, but it's abstract. Then we mashed the databases together and we got five clusters where users stories about their gardens clustered with technology capability. Three of those became major businesses, one of which I'm quite ashamed of. Yeah, you can actually buy now a light in Southeast Asia which changes color and the colors are garish based on human proximity in your swimming pool. Now it's selling really well, I'm ashamed to have been involved in its creation. It uses a core technology designed for a football stadium in the Netherlands designed to handle urine strained, what, you know, the, the, the wash basins where you get urine on the floors. It's designed to survive that. Now nobody would have thought of repurposing in that way, but when we showed that they'd been indexed in the same way, people would say, I know why, because we could do this with it. Yeah, I know why the chocolate bar melts, it's because actually it's cooking, therefore we can create a microwave. You see the principle here? Now these are four types of innovation and the problem at the moment is all of us are in here and we're not working here. And that's where actually the big advantage will actually come. Now, I talked about identifying outliers. This is actually an example of a map which came from that process I showed you. So what we've done is presented data to lots of people, they've interpreted it, this is actually a thing called a fitness landscape, which comes from Stu Kaufman in biology. And what it identifies is patterns. So on the left-hand side, you can see that there's a dominant view down here. That means if I do that, nobody's going to complain. We actually do this as real-time decision port for executives. If you've got an intractable problem, 
you present it to the whole of the workforce, they interpret it. Within an hour, you have the map. If all of your workforce feel that that's the way it's working, you're fairly safe to move forward. But also here, I've got two outliers, one extreme. So I now go and look at these because that's where the real novelty will come from. Remember I talked about finding the 17% before they talk to the 83%. Yeah? This one, you can see there are similar outliers, but they're more connected. That actually is significant. That outlier is going to be easier to get acceptance than that outlier. That's kind of like a wild person idea. So far away from the norm, it will be difficult to get accepted. That's a wild idea, but it's connected with the norm. And so this gives us a far more data once we actually learn to interpret them. This is the example I mentioned of Exaptive. So this is basically technology ideas, user needs. We add in the high abstraction metadata, we fuse the two, and there we get the clusters. Now, I say some of those clusters work, some don't. Yep. Now all of that is about sensing patterns without analysis because we're dealing with a complex system. In a complex system, if you do analysis, your old way of thinking will apply. Yeah, remember we talked about you only see what you expect to see? These are about making things visible that you didn't expect to see, so you can see the significance. That leads me on to the final point I want to talk about, which is scaffolding. Now I'm going to go through the types of scaffolding here, and then can like finish off. And this has come out of a body of work, um, multiple workshops over the last year. And what we've been working on is looking on different types of scaffolding. So I'll run through them, then indicate how we use them. So this one here is the most stable form. It's the one you always know. This is steel scaffolding. Yeah, that's what you put around the building. Yeah, so it's lots of steel tubes. You put it up. You kind of like know what the building's got to look like, but it provides structure while the building comes. You could, if you want, use this as a metaphor for an agile coach. Yeah, except agile coaches forget that you're meant to remove the scaffolding when the building is there. Right? The purpose is not the scaffolding, the purpose is to enable something else. We then get a more flexible form. If you ever go to Hong Kong, you'll see this sort of thing, which is bamboo poles strung together with raffia. It's actually much more resilient than the steel poles. You can adapt it and change it very quickly, whereas you can't adapt the steel poles. But it requires a high skill base to implement. So you see I'm starting to move with higher levels of uncertainty as I go around this. Yeah? But both of those are what we call exoskeletons. So the skeleton is external to the system. Yeah, that means the system is bound by the scaffolding. The system can't expand beyond the scaffolding. It's bound by the external structure. Now, that's actually an important concept I'm going to build on now. We then get this. This is a really interesting thing. Um, it's a nutrient lattice. So if you get a bad burn these days, people will put a nutrient lattice over the burn, which provides a structure around which the skin can regrow. But it seeps nutrients into the skin, so it gradually dissolves as the skin rebuilds. Yeah, so it's basically, the nutrient is a scaffolding. It provides structure, but it disappears. Yeah, it's still kind of like external, but it's got more fluidity and you've got more variation possible. Then it gets even more interesting. You then get this. I've forgotten the name of this, but it's a cartilage-type product that you put on somebody's heart, and it gradually dissolves into the heart, finds areas of weak transmission, and leaves microelectrical circuits in place. So this actually rebuilds internal structures in order the system can regenerate. Now, it's actually a very exciting modern medical development, but you can see some of the implications. And then we move on to what we call dark scaffolding, or shadow scaffolding. So this is extreme sports. I used to have a kayak when I was young, and I thought I was really cool because I could do an Eskimo roll. Right? That's minor to get what they now do. These guys take off over 100-foot waterfalls and live. Yeah, now, the, actually, the technology, the social practices, everything which surrounds that have evolved over four to five decades. You couldn't design it from scratch. It has to evolve. It's a complex ecosystem. 
Now, it's actually one of the most resilient scaffoldings you've got, but you can actually manage it on an evolutionary growth basis. You can't design it from scratch. Then we get structured again. This is the keystone, most stable form of architecture. So once you put scaffolding up, you build the arch, you put the keystone in, it's a rigid structure. You can build anything on top of it. But that's actually the danger. If you ever go to the catacombs in Rome, yeah, you'll find they're a series of arches. But they're built on top of other arches, and there are eight levels of arches built on top of that. You remove the wrong keystone at the wrong time, everything may be collapsed. You can see the legacy, you know, the legacy code issue in this. You may be building on structures, and you may change something and not realize the consequences in terms of the way it works. That's kind of like precautionary. Now, as we move around here, we have what are called endoskeletons. So the skeleton is internal to the system, not external. So as human beings, we have endoskeletons, not exoskeletons. So that means we can actually grow. Insects are limited in their growth. The biggest insect is about this size. Don't believe the science fiction movies which show giant ants. That isn't possible physically. Yeah, an endoskeleton has huge variety within a stable structure. So kind of like the next stage of design is first of all to decide what sort of scaffolding you want and work from that. And within that, there's a key concept. This is a type of fungus. It's called a microcosia, which I can't pronounce. It's a symbiosis between a fungus and a green plant. And basically, symbiosis is key because, for example, the gut in your, the bacteria in your gut started off as a parasite. They're now a symbiote. You're totally dependent on them. If you look at a Portuguese man of war, it looks like a jellyfish. It isn't. It's about a hundred different organisms which have learned to coexist to form one organization. The key metaphor here is that of the informal networks within an organization. Informal networks are the nutrient which keep the formal system together, but like a fungus, they sort of grow and spread and they can't be mapped, yeah, and they can't be found and they can't be managed. Well, they can be managed, but in a different way. So a couple of ideas on that. In fact, one idea, then I'm going to conclude with culture. One of the big things we're doing now is the pre-scrum technique is to use trios. We originally developed this in urban change projects where we got somebody young to get together with their grandparent to come up with ideas for improvement in their community. If they came up with a good idea, they were put into a threesome with somebody from the government who could make their ideas work. That's called transgenerational pairing. Young people with old people is the best innovation you have. Right, just to get you all worried, if you're between 25 and 45, the chance of you innovating is pretty non-existent. Yeah, so it means it's good news because once you pass 45, 50, you'll innovate again because the brain becomes plastic. Yeah, so the brain is very plastic up to the early 20s, but then it actually forms based on the prejudices of your society. It becomes an primitive society. If you survive to 45, 50, you've got something about you. You can't lead the tribe, but you go into teaching and wisdom. Yeah, ex yeah, innovation in the humanities is people over 50. In the raw sciences, is under 25. You can see the reason there? So we put very young people together with people about to retire, and actually that's the best innovation pairing you've got because you've got network capability with bright ideas. Now the other thing we do in IT design is we put a young designer together with an experienced systems tester or systems architect. So somebody who's good at the core code with somebody who sees the system as a whole together with a user trained to talk to IT people. It's a lot easier to train users to talk to IT people than it is to train IT people to understand users. Yeah, I hate to tell you this, but it is. We then throw 30 or 40 trios at the problem rather than sending out a systems analyst. And the young bright coder produces prototypes which people test. And the ones which people want become backlog and go into Scrum. This is one of about eight techniques we've been developing to map into the informal networks to find out what's really going on in a distributed way. And that's another example of distributed design. The final one to throw into the pool is something I originally developed in DSDM, which is called Triple Eight, which allows me to draw CND symbols on audiences. Yeah. 
Um, that's where you get a RAD team. You do a joint application design, something the Agile community have forgotten. It's where you actually get a group of users together with a group of coders for an intensive day and they produce a prototype. Yeah, there's a whole body of method on this. It's really worth, if you don't know about it, rediscovering it. Like it's worth rediscovering time boxes because there are other alternatives to two-week sprints, yeah, which have different design capability. Yeah, but basically what you do here is you put a JAD session together, you produce the prototype. First time we did this, we did it in London. We then passed the prototype over to Mumbai, which is on a different time difference, without access to the user requirement, and said improve it. Then they sent it on to another team in San Francisco and actually said, they said improve it. So we had two developments without access to the users. Every time we've done it, when the users look at the result the next morning, they say, God, I wouldn't have thought that. Could I please have it? What we're doing is do in, in, introducing deliberate mutation in rapid cy life cycle into the system to allow novelty to emerge. Now, all of those are about mapping or using the informal network. And underneath all of it is kind of like the last point I want to make, really. And it comes back to where the speaker started. If your culture isn't right, none of this will work. And culture is not about mindset. You can't say, I want this, an agile mindset. That's a nonsense statement. You have to measure what your culture is and nudge it in a direction you want to travel. You can't design what needs to be an emergent property. And the other thing you need in it, and it comes back to that point about diversity, is you need what's called coherent heterogeneity. You don't want everybody thinking the same way. The myth that you need to have common objectives and common values is holding back agile development. That's called homogenization, and it's very dangerous because it destroys variety. What you need is differences which can come together when they need to. So to give you a very simple illustration, this I'm Welsh. It's the rugby season. Yeah, we're playing as Wales at the moment, so I wear a red shirt, and the only thing that matters is beating the English. Right? This is a very important feature in Wales. During the more normal season, I wear a blue shirt because I support Cardiff Blues, and there are those bastards up the road from Thanetley who cheat and bribe referees. Yeah, so we have violent disagreements, but we sit on the terrace together and we still drink beer. We're not like football fans. But when the English come, we're Welsh. You see what I mean by coherent heterogeneity? We can be different and the same in different contexts. The attempt to homogenize Agile is actually a variation of the commoditization of Agile. We need to radically think, and to quote Lincoln, we need to not only think in you, but we need to act in you. And that's kind of like what I wanted to say. Open to any questions. We haven't got long, and I can't see anybody anyway, and I'm hoping I upset some people. Anybody want to ask a question or come up with an argument? They promised me you would. If not, we'll go to coffee early. No. Okay, cool, guys. All right, I'll be around for a bit. And that's it. Dave, Dave, I had a question here. Oh, sorry, there's a question. Go on. Sorry, you have to sit down again, all right? It's your own fault. <laughs> I can't see anything. It's so dark. Yeah, go on. Yes. Uh, so what is your suggestion about how can we incorporate some of this kind of design thinking into schools? Ah, okay. Um, several things, all right? And we actually have a program which is running in Malmo, Wales, Colombia, Singapore, and about to start in Australia in which children become ethnographers to their own communities. So basically the children go out and gather stories from those communities, we train them how to analyze the material and we train them to run workshops at which they can come up with those local initiatives. All right? So we teach them design by doing, not just in theory, it's a mixture of theory and practice. So that's one way, that's a public program anybody can join. The other thing is I think we desperately need to reintroduce um, art and design into schools, and that can be done quite well. I got really frustrated at school because I loved technical drawing. But this is Britain in the 1960s. You weren't allowed to do technical drawing if you were in the grammar school because you were held to be an academic, so you weren't allowed to do it. We were allowed to do woodwork. That was considered a hobby. 
right? Um, the girls did cookery, all right? You weren't allowed to do metal work because that was done by people who were going to be metal workers. Right? So I think teaching people design, but not design in terms of software. I wouldn't teach kids software at the moment because by the time they actually are coding, software is going to be so radically different. Anything we teach them now is a waste of time and they're learning it at home anyway, through games and anything. We should be teaching them ethics, we should be teaching them aesthetics, we should be teaching them design, we should be teaching them social and human interaction, because those are going to be the key skills. Yeah, part of the problem we've got at the moment is AI, which is one of the existential threats to humanity. The training data sets and the algorithms are beginning to be produced by people who are on the west coast of the US who are generally misogynists who spent their entire life on computers and take Anne Rand seriously after puberty. Right? And that's a really dangerous group of people to define in the future. So schools, I think, need practice, community engagement, ethics and aesthetics before they need technical skills. Those can be acquired later.